the Truckee River. It's vibrant, it's healthy, and yet at the same time seems strangely peaceful. But on the first day of 1997, these waters turned violent. Not only these, but also the waters in the Carson and the Walker Rivers. You know, there's something about a natural disaster and something about the community that we live in. It seemed that the worst of times brought out the best in people. Hi, I'm Channel 2 meteorologist Mike Alger. For the next hour, we will relive the New Year's flood of 1997 as captured through the eyes of our photographers and as reported by the Channel 2 staff. First, a look back at the awesome power of the New Year's flood. Later, we'll find words, but from these pictures, words cannot possibly describe the initial impact.
the higher the water gets, the more it cleans off the banks and and the more it comes. And as you can see, the water just keeps getting higher. So that just means there's more debris being washed down every every minute of the day. So it's just a it's really amazing how much material does go down. This is only a small portion of what is going by. We're just trying to keep the bridge unplugged and and it's just amazing how much there is. Even when you look at these pictures over and over, the power of the water, the scope of the damage, it's overwhelming. In some areas, rivers crested nearly 10 feet above flood stage. But all of this didn't just happen overnight. This was actually the beginning of the New Year's flood. Who could have thought that a white Christmas could have such terrible consequences? The valley floors received a blanket of more than a foot in some places. Higher in the Sierra, several feet of fresh snow on top of an already enormous snowpack. And then, the worst possible combination. Temperatures suddenly shot up. The snow level rose to 10,000 feet. And wave after wave of tropical moisture began melting the snow. Now in the town of Truckee, and ultimately everywhere else down there, as the deluge continued from the sky, there was just no holding the torrent of water within the banks. A major flood, an historic flood, was inevitable. I'm at Rock Park right now, and there isn't much of a park left here at all. You can see behind me the raging Truckee River through this part of Sparks, and see those bars right there? That's where the jogging path goes through this area, so that really shows how much the water has come up. Now, at the River's Edge Trailer Park, it was difficult to distinguish where the river ended and the park began. 110 RVs were parked here at 10 o'clock this morning, but by 11 o'clock, 
Water had flooded the entire area, forcing people to evacuate. Many residents stayed behind to help elderly people pack up. Still others stayed to remove propane tanks from vacant RVs. Now, local businesses are also lending a hand tonight. Baldini's Casino, as well as several others, offered parking spaces for many people who didn't have any other place to go. Just when I thought that I couldn't get any worse out here, it has. It must, something must have happened upstream because all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of debris that came floating quickly down the river. The bulldozer that was working hard is working even harder now, trying to pick up the debris, trying to make sure that the bridge doesn't clog any more than it is. We've seen all kinds of things. We've seen pipes. We've seen some shoes. We've seen lots of tree limbs. So it's a really an amazing situation down here. I'm at the new county courthouse overlooking where the river walk used to be. And it's, you know, it's so ironic that this is what you're looking right now is some of the bulldozer and picking up large chunks, trying to clear the entire Truckee along one of our local bridges, all the bridges down here. Sierra Street, Virginia, Arlington, Center Street, they are all full of water. At this point, it appears to be either a 50 or a 100 year flood. That means you don't see this kind of flood more than perhaps once every 100 years or so. It's already on the scale of the major flood they had back in the 1950 area. Those who lived in the Truckee Meadows more than 40 years ago suddenly had a terrible flashback. This was downtown Reno in 1955. An amazing sight, one we hoped would never be repeated. And then came the morning of January 2nd. In any natural disaster, there are images that just stick with you. This quite literally was a sign of the times. The Truckee River just went its own. The levels that kept going higher and higher. Now this was really our first glimpse at how bad the flooding had become for downtown Reno. From the roof of the Cal Neva, Channel 2 photographer Martin Christian just kept rolling. As a photographer, you try and pick out things that are relative, and a basketball net or a one-way sign, water up to the bottom of the sign, people can identify with that. And that's when it really hit me that the river was getting really seriously out of control. since five this morning we continue to bring uh, you the latest on the flood situation um, we want to show you some pictures now that one of our channel 2 photographers shot just about an hour ago in uh, downtown Reno As you can see, the roads in uh, through downtown Reno are just covered with water. The water is very strong as well. It's rushing through um, uh, Virginia Street, completely flooded. Uh, they were sandbagging, uh, as you can see uh, earlier when our photographer was down. Um, but it looks like they are fighting a losing battle, at least for now. This right here um, is the Cal Neva. I, all morning I had been saying, today. this um, business is closed, this road is closed, getting all this information out. And uh, it's one thing to do that and hear about how many people are being affected by this. But the pictures is what we're all about. And when those came in, I s it was unbelievable. Along the banks and in front of buildings, the battle was on. An army of volunteers were out moving tons of sand. Some of these barriers held, but many buildings found themselves no match to the relentless water and mud. This is the crown jewel of Reno's arts community, the Pioneer Center. And this is what happened to the Holy Trinity Church. The church itself made it out okay, but floodwaters forced the Montessori School to relocate. We don't call this an act of God. We call this don't fool around with Mother Nature. 
<laughs> and Mother Nature, you know, really is a good reminder that she's more powerful than all of us exactly. combined. Exactly. Exactly. It's awesome, isn't it? It's awesome. And last night, I understand some of the parents were down here trying to sandbag the school. Right. And it all just washed away. Yeah, it washed away at six. We had all kinds of people: parishioners, parents, uh, the prisoners were here with us. They couldn't have done a more fantastic job of cooperating. Everybody did, gave it their best shot, but uh, that water just wouldn't uh, wouldn't give in to us. We gave in to it. From Reno to Sparks to Gardnerville to the mountains, the problem became no one could get in or out. Bus and train service shut down. The airport underwater. Most roads impassable. And then a new problem. Terry Hardesty is standing by live at the Helms Pit. And Terry, I understand there is some flooding down there. Now, Chris, what's happening here right now, I'm at Interstate 80 in the Helms Pit. You can see this large truck going by right here filled with rocks. Um, right beyond this truck, there is a sinkhole that has developed right next to the Helms Pit. And what it's doing is it's eroding and it's coming closer and closer to Interstate 80. And that is a, a big concern because this freeway could buckle under in some places if it actually hits the freeway. So what they are doing is this tractor is, is dumping in rocks into the hole. And that is hopefully going to keep this from eroding further. And uh, That, of course, would be an omen for what was to come later over at the Helms Pit. Back at our studios, this was a shot from our cloud camp as the flood came closer to us. She just got here just the way I did earlier today. We had to be helicoptered in, and you brought along some video with you to share with all the people at home to show what it's like out there. That's right. On the way in, we actually took a little bit of a tour over Washoe Valley and also over the airport, and it was unbelievable. I've seen some of it from the pictures that we've taken, but up above the ground, you can see Washoe Valley anyway, and Washoe Lake has just basically surrounded everything. You can see where 395 is uh, almost covered with water. Old 395 is certainly covered. Let's see if we can have any pictures here. You're looking at uh, 395 south of Reno, and it is just, I mean, that is one Have you ever solid. Seen anything like this before? No, it's kind of hard to believe that uh, a year ago, well, maybe two years ago now, this whole area was just completely dry. You're hearing the voice of our, our helicopter pilot there, and uh, it, it, that is just one solid mass of water. It is just simply amazing. There's fields that are flooded. It's coming How up. How long do you think it'll take for all this to go back? Take, uh... It's a mess down there. We also took some pictures at the airport, and it was just amazing to see the runways are actually just flooded and to see huge jets sitting in the middle of water. That is truly amazing. Is that from the Truckee River? Yes. Uh, we'll be hitting the Truckee here about another mile further. I'm not sure where the, the water is coming from to uh, fill up the airport, though. I understand it's coming from the hilt, from the uh, lake at the okay, hilt. Yeah. You can actually see airplanes sitting in water. It's amazing. It was, uh, it was something to see, and it just looks like it's going to be some tough uh, problems for a lot of folks. And um, just amazing. John, I don't know what to tell you, except that it was, I I've never seen anything like it. The pilot's been here since 1972. He said he's never seen anything like it either. I don't think a lot of us have ever seen anything like that. And the, and the funny thing is seeing the Washoe Valley area, because uh, to this point, we hadn't been able to get any pictures of it. That's yeah. what it was. If we could maybe even cue that tape up again and, and take a look at that. Just Washoe Lake itself looks like a huge, huge, lake now. It's, it's not this little tiny lake that we're all used to seeing now. The water just all over the freeway. And as John Kelly pointed out, that was dry several years ago, completely dry. So it's, it's amazing out there, and I'm sure we'll have more to show you. But it was a nice, smooth ride, although a little foggy and kind of rainy. I'm glad to be back on the ground. And this so is the video once it. again. I mean, if you take a look at that, this is, like I said, some of the first pictures we've seen for a while of, of the Washoe Valley area. I mean, Jen, I know that uh, we drive that way at, to and from Carson City, but looking at it there, I certainly wouldn't want to be out there. No, and it's actually is closed, um, and it's it'll be tough to get down that way. I know there's a lot of alternate routes, but that one's just that's gone.
Michael, I understand that you are joined by the governor. Yes, that is right, Chris. Governor Bob Miller joins us now. You've been trying to get in here all day. It's just been a struggle for you, right? Well, it's difficult for anybody, and, and it's a very frightening sight when we finally did. I landed at Stead, but on the way, we passed over the Reno Airport, and you can see that the airport runway is submerged. So it, then beyond that, the water uh, to the, the uh, west, excuse me, to the east of that, uh, has completely submerged uh, both residential and commercial areas. Uh, we took a helicopter tour all the way down to Gardnerville, and there's some houses there that are several feet of water in them. Uh, and the whole west side of the valley out there looks like it's a big lake. Uh, and then you get back up through the valleys to here, you can see all the roads closed. You get to the Truckee and see where it's, it's overflowed and, and the damage it's caused uh, from residential upstream down into the commercial downstream. So uh, I spoke. Uh, about uh, half an hour ago to James Witt, who's the director of federal emergency management at the national level, and he's going to be, whatever assistance he can, we're getting the paperwork to him to make sure that he uh, can proceed therein and have the president, uh, hopefully in the near future, declare it a, a disaster at the national level as we've already done at the state and local level. Welcome back to our Stormwatch coverage. There is an intensive search going on right now for an emergency worker. We understand he was swept into the Carson River. Douglas County officials say the man was shoring up a berm near the Riverview Trailer Park. That's about five miles south of Gardnerville. The bank gave way and he fell into the raging current. It happened about an hour ago, they say, on the East Fork of the Carson. Emergency crews are desperately looking with helicopters and searchlights and also on the ground. Once again, a Douglas County emergency worker has been swept into the Carson River. We'll pass along any updated information we get as we get it. Boy, that's tough to hear. And of course, a lot of us have been talking because all the public officials are telling us to have people stay away from the rivers. That goes for the Truckee and the Carson. Here was someone who was actually trying to perform an emergency service. The bank gave way and, and he was swept in. It shows just how dangerous it can be out there. Our John Mercer is not in quite such a precarious position, fortunately. There's a lot of water around him, though. Uh, John, I understand you're on Sparks Boulevard at Prater Way. That's right. I'm at the Park Vista Apartments, where if you can look behind me right now, you can see the car behind me over there. Uh, the water actually has not receded much here at all. If anything, it's actually gotten a little higher than the last time we went live, maybe about 45 minutes ago. So things are not looking good. Uh, the power did go off here at the apartment complex, apparently nowhere else in the area, but just here at the apartment complex. But uh, thanks to Sierra Pacific Crews, whatever they could do, because it was back on in just a matter of minutes. Welcome back, folks, to our Stormwatch coverage of the New Year's Flood of 1997. I'm John Mercer. Thanks for staying with us here on Channel 2 for all the latest information. As we've been telling you, Sparks has been very hard hit by what's been going on there, and Tim Robinson has been out there all morning long, and he joins us now live with the latest information for us. Tim? John, thank you very much. Uh, they are looking like they're about to stem the tide here as far as that small river goes that has degraded the shoulder of Interstate 80 between Sparks Boulevard and McCarran Boulevard. Uh, that uh, water, the little river that is running right along the shoulder, uh, as we've been telling you all morning, has eaten away and a 100-foot chunk of the concrete freeway <coughs> has fallen into the Helms Pit. Uh, the chunk that fell in is the shoulder. Uh, Tim, if you could just give people one more look way down there uh, along the shoulder where we're standing. That fell in this morning about 5 in the morning, and since then uh, the crews have really been working quickly uh, to get things uh, done here and stop, first of all, this water right here that is running down, and as it falls, cascades down 100 feet, 120 feet into the pit, it is... Uh, causing some turbulence and uh, it's churning up down there and in fact it is uh, eating under the freeway, continuing to eat under the freeway. So what they're doing now, uh, Nevada Department of Transportation and granite construction crews, uh, what they're doing now is bringing in these huge boulders. Uh, they are dropping the boulders into where the river is. That uh, great big steam shovel there is uh, digging up tons and tons of mud and dirt so uh, to put it here to make a small dam so the uh, river does not run continue to run this makeshift river continue to run into the helms pit uh, here this water here is coming out of a culvert on the uh, south side of interstate 80 on the uh, side towards reno and carson city um, it's coming under 
the culvert under the freeway and running down there. They dug a trench earlier today, so the water will go into the pit way, way down there. So once they get uh, that water going down there, they get this uh, dammed up right here, then they'll be able to better assess what it is they need to do to fill this great big huge hole that has been created. You don't realize it at first. You're so busy worried about composition and how you're going to make the shot look. I mean, that as a photographer, that's what you are trained to think about. So you don't think about that. And until I got up to the edge and I held the shot and I looked around and then I opened up my left eye. Usually you keep it shut when you're doing shooting so you can kind of see what's going on. As I opened it up, then I could see everything beneath me and, and the road dropped off 200 feet down to the bottom of Helm's Pit water running down there it is it's a sight. This little prick on the on your me on your left now. I was watching it your road as I was watching it. For a while there was some talk about closing Interstate 80 indefinitely. But as it turned out they reopened the entire freeway in just four days time. An amazing feat of engineering and human willpower. And what we've shown you so far is how we covered the flood as it was happening. But while it's important to provide immediacy, it's also important to provide perspective. What is your destination? Uh, destination is Carson Valley. Departure frequency 119.0. Taking off from the Reno Tahoe Airport's not a problem anymore, but the problems still remain all across our region. Floodwaters washed away the land around the Helms Pit in Sparks and continue to take pieces of the freeway with it. The industrial area of Sparks also suffered damage. Business owners are slowly being able to come in and check out the damage. Much of the floodwaters remain. As we head south, more signs of devastation. Hidden Valley residents are hit hard by the flood of 1997. The area hit most recently, residents who live along the Walker River. Above the Mason Valley, you can see the homes submerged in water. The Walker River was the last of our local rivers to let loose its wrath. Residents along the Walker will soon be dealing with the same problems as people along the Truckee and the Carson, checking out the damage left behind and starting the long process of cleaning up. Red light, come on. Nevada's three most influential politicians, Senator Reed, Senator Bryan, and Governor Miller, toured the areas affected by the flooding. I think without question what I told uh, Leon Panetta and the other Washington officials yesterday that we had a disaster here was re is really true. There is a disaster. What they witnessed is a number of counties ravaged by the worst flooding in decades. Near State Line, a mudslide on I-80 pushes traffic to one lane. In several areas, the Truckee turns from a raging river into wide expanses. In downtown Reno, bridges have re-emerged from the water. Buildings that were surrounded by water are muddy, but on relatively dry ground. Throughout the downtown, flooding left streets covered with a layer of mud. The Hilton Reservoir, which overflowed, is still full. But as we move over to the airport, there is good news. As you look out, the runways, once covered with water, are now drying off. In the Hidden Valley area, which is east of the go down in the industrial area, there is worry about what types of chemicals are mixed in the water. An aerial view of the Helms Pit shows dramatic pictures of how the land is giving way. A portion of I-80 is threatened as the land is washed away by water that continues to cascade into the pit. As we move over to Derby Dam, a log jam isn't slowing the flow of water. In Lockwood, the river, which came up to the road, has now dropped down a few feet. As we move south to Washoe Valley, the images of submerged homes seem to be endless. Expensive homes, the golf course, and roads are still waiting for the water to pull back. In terms of money, there is no word on how much this flood will cost, but this will be Nevada's costliest flood in terms of property damage. FEMA and the Corps of Engineers are ready to help. We're in the desert, but it looks more like you're in uh, Southeast Asian rice paddies during the monsoon season. We can't take away the pain, but we can ease it.
It's a site that's hard to comprehend. Quarter mile stretches of Highway 395 blown away by a raging river. It'll be a long time before traffic flows through the Walker River Canyon. And that's not good news for people in Douglas County. Commissioner Kelly Kite calls the highway a lifeline. Again, the road is, is super important to us and for our economy. If Friday nights, Sunday nights, cars and strings with the skis on top. Uh, South County businesses are completely shut off. Today, Commissioner Kite and State Senator Lawrence Jacobson got a first-hand look at what Mother Nature can do. I was, uh, I guess, really surprised to see that there was more damage than what I anticipated, although I had heard rumors that the road to Bridgeport was gone. Uh, but you got to see it to believe it. It's not just the highway. Parts of homes lie perilously close to the water's edge. It's obvious from this tour, there's a lot of rebuilding to do from the ground up. Guardrails lie crumpled, the highway reduced to chunks of asphalt. Officials say federal money is on the way, but reconstruction could take months. The effects of this flood are being felt by farmers, businesses, homeowners, and tourists. In downtown Reno, it took a while for businesses to reopen. It took even longer to get the word out. Now that's understandable when you see what downtown looked like on January 3rd. Disaster. Sheer disaster. Unbelievable. Downtown Reno facing its latest challenge, mud and debris, and lots of it. It is a, a more than a muddy mess. It's, it's, it's a total mess. It, it's really, really bad. These streets were filled with four to six feet of water. The powerful current of the Truckee River rushed into dozens of businesses. Volunteers have just begun their attempt to clean up the muck. I got some insurance. I'm going to go home and read my policy. <laughs> Inside the Woolworth store, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise now litter two floors. In the basement, plumbers say there's one million gallons of water. We're not real happy about it, probably not more than anybody else, but quite a mess. The battle to save Virginia Street took place here. They quickly put up this barricade to protect the major casinos in the area. And the casinos that hold thousands of tourists, for the most part, stayed dry. But the visitors were stranded with the flooded airport shut down. We're told that we may be up to four days, which we're not prepared for uh, financially, nor anything. And already the flood of 97 has become a popular tourist attraction, with more people interested in the Truckee River than ever before. Unfortunately, this is not how businesses wanted to attract attention. In other areas, the same situation. The worst was over, or was it? The cleanup had begun. But what damage, what long-term impact would be found? You're about to see how folks all along the Truckee, Carson, and Walker Rivers came to grips with the flooding. I'm hoping to get in there pretty soon, get our computers out of the office and get the files off the floor and see how much damage we actually have. How about you over here? Well, I uh, work at a company in there and uh, I'm hoping that we can get in there because I have a computer in there I'd like to get out. and. Uh, Supposedly, there's only six to eight inches of water on the floor. But you're saying, sir, that you saw water up to past the door? We walked on uh, the back part of the building there, and the water line is, uh, has traveled about 18 inches off the, uh, above the doorway. Uh, we were unable to see inside because of the doors here. Let me ask you about how much inventory is in there. Well, this is our major West Coast distribution center. It's probably two to three million dollars worth of finished goods. It's going to be a while still. Sorry. Business owners wait while water continues to cover a big part of the industrial section in various streets. One man found out the hard way why he shouldn't have snuck into the area. He drove his Jeep down this street, stalled, and had to be rescued. I wouldn't want any of that water on me. You know, we wash it all off because, you know, most of it's sewage. Standing water can be a problem for the public for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can see that bubbling up right there. That is raw sewage water coming up through a manhole. The second reason it can be a problem is if the water pressure is high enough, it can actually knock the manhole cover off, and then somebody walking through the water won't be able to see an open hole they could fall in. The work is slow going. Hazardous materials are being discovered and isolated here and there. 
It's hard to believe, but eventually this area will be cleaned up and it will hopefully be business as usual. It was up to here on my trailer. A little bit of water got inside. Yeah, and it was, oh, it was everything was just floating gas tanks. Delton Sanders lives in the Lockwood trailer park where things are far from normal, barely getting back to inhabitable. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do here, but some people, they just, I don't think they'll be able to move back. Delton's trailer sits higher than many of his neighbors. Water only made it into the back portion of his home, but he did lose a lot of belongings that were outside. Delton says when you see your possessions being washed away, it's hard to know whether to laugh or cry. I had some friends where we were down at the bridge and I saw it uh, float back to my gas can. <laughs> and then I saw the spare tire to my truck, I saw it float down. <laughs> There's nothing I could do. You know? Many of the trailers are still dark. Their owners opting to sleep in motor homes along the freeway. The Lockwood store, which at one point was in two feet of water, remains closed. There is concern the food may be contaminated. While the west end of Lockwood flooded, the main subdivision was untouched by the water. The river came up to the road and then receded. It's peaceful and quiet out here and everything, but it's, I don't think it's worth all this. This is the first night Delton was able to return to his home. And now he's wondering if after 25 years here, it's time to consider leaving for good. It bothers you, you know, it, it's such a mess. And after it's all cleaned up and everything, probably everything will be fine. You know, but right now it's pretty frustrating. The water is finally going down in Hidden Valley, but the hard work has just begun. Ken Dunbar is just starting to realize how badly the flood ravaged his home. Three feet of water soaked every piece of furniture. The family is moving what they can into a garage. They ripped everything out, including the carpet, but mud is caked on all their belongings. Everything you touch has this flood water on it, and you, it, your clothes soak it up, and you're afraid to just even you know, wipe your nose or scratch your face. Ken says friends and family are washing mud-soaked clothes and dishes, doing anything to get them back on their feet. All around Hidden Valley, there's remains of the flood. Mud and guck is all throughout many parking lots and many driveways. But there should be a railroad tie here. But that railroad tie, because of the high water, floated all the way to the other side and stopped on a fence. The only thing that kept it here was it was tied to a tree. The damage is worse the lower you go into Hidden Valley. Five feet of water rushed into Peggy and John Harmon's house. The couple is trying to dry out 49 years of memories together, but many treasures are lost. Peggy knows a piano she played for more than 60 years will never make music again. My piano and our pictures and, and our, you know, our, our keepsakes. In fact, I've been telling my kids, you better get these and take them home. <laughs> the Harmons already survived one flood in 1986, but the couple says they won't be here for another. Now you both looked at each other and said, no more, huh? This is it for you? <laughs> that's that's well, right. I think so, yeah. Yeah. We can't handle another one of these. And by the time our crews could get through to Carson City, most of the water had receded, leaving behind a muddy mess. The Carson River crested four feet above flood stage. Damage was heavy throughout the Carson Valley, and for a while, residents could not get in or out of the Gardnerville Rancho subdivision. And in Dayton, hip waders almost weren't good enough. On some roads, water consumed just about everything, including part of one man's house. What should be here in my bedroom? my 40-foot pitch wheel, and I would have woke up going down the river. But one of the hardest hit places was the town of Yarrington, where 400 homes flooded out. This winter, ski poles have a new use. After floodwaters tore through the Reno Sparks area, they headed right for the tiny town of Yarrington. He knocked on my window and told me to to pack some things to get out in about an hour because it was on its way. The flood of 97. No town along the Truckee, Carson, or Walker rivers is immune to the destruction. By Friday, Earrington was filling up with water. Now a dramatic drop in temperatures is creating another problem. 
People are breaking through a layer of ice to get to their homes. I still didn't get a lot of things. My medication's inside. I've been going about my medication. <laughs> we were out of town. We were Bill Hansen was in Wisconsin when he heard his home might be in danger. He couldn't get back because the airport was under several feet of water. But his neighbors were looking out for him the entire time. I had about six inches of water in my garage, but uh, it's, uh, everything was up high and dry. The house is high and dry. The floor was dry. Thanks to Mr. McGowan, he sandbagged it. The flooding devoured Highway 208 through Wilson Canyon that connects Smith Valley to Urington. Uh, Wilson Canyon, where they flooded out up there, is named after my great-grandfather. And uh, I've never seen anything like it. In Gardnerville, the swift moving waters of the Carson River flamed to life. On January 2nd, you heard about the intensive search for a Douglas County worker. Well, here's the story of a man whose efforts will never be forgotten. Fred was a very caring and gentle man. Um, he'd put himself, put you before him anytime. He'd give you the shirt off of his back. Fred Pennard is now feared dead. He was last seen working a loader, hauling in dirt to this part of the Carson River. The loader was to bring the dirt down and the backhoe was putting it in. But it was going a little bit too slow, so he decided to push it in with the loader and the bank gave way. You can see where the river ripped out the earth from right under these mobile homes. This is where Fred was working when something went horribly wrong. When the, when the uh, tractor started to fall in, he was told to jump out of the cab because both doors were open. And I imagine he must have froze on the wheel. He couldn't, he couldn't get out. Fred had just returned to work several years ago. He took time off to take care of his dying wife. He quit work to take care of Sandra. Sandra was um, ill for a number of years, and he stayed home to take care of her. Despite an intensive search, there was no sign of Fred or the loader for several days. Residents of the mobile home park had an eerie reminder the loader was still nearby. The beeper on the loader kept, was still going this morning. Several days later, crews pulled the loader from the river. It was 200 yards downstream from where it disappeared. And now, the east fork of the Carson River is believed to be Fred's gravesite. It's a difficult thing because they haven't been able to find uh, Fred, the body, and so it kind of puts everything in limbo. And uh, so we're just hanging in there the best we can. Coming to grips with the flood, it's hard enough for many adults, but how do you explain it to your kids? Is anybody worried about the water? Flood water surrounded the Stepping Stones Daycare Center in Reno last week. Now, all looks well, but mental health experts say many of these kids are still dealing with the trauma of the flood. Student Heather Sykes' family was forced to evacuate. Very, 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 so close. How many of you were worried about your parents? Ray Rich is with the American Red Cross. He says even if kids weren't directly affected by the flood, it can have a lasting impact. An interesting point about children is that they don't have a lot of reality, a lot of experience in dealing with various situations. And so as a result, they will also have their own emotions and reactions. And Rich says unless those unique feelings are dealt with, they can come out in nightmares, temper tantrums, or in other negative behaviors. The most important thing you can do is to talk to people. To Rich says getting kids to talk about their feelings is the best therapy. I sat down with these kids to hear what they had to say. Nick was sad about all the loss. I'd say um, I would help you rebuild your house. Heather was relieved that her home was spared. I want a house around my house and looked and nothing was damaged and I was very happy. Sarah wants to help out with the animals. Also, I saw on TV that lots of birds died and oil was all on them. When I grow up, I, I'm going to be a veterinarian to maybe help the birds up. All the children in Grace Langfield's class were affected in some way by the flood, 
Most felt better talking about it. And in days to come, there'll be more chances for these kids to express themselves. The Red Cross left a coloring book, just another way for these kids to recover. During the height of the flood, Teresa Estacio kept reporting, even though she had more than her share of heartache to deal with. Teresa's home in Hidden Valley suffered extensive damage, and as the waters began receding, she filed the following reports. This is what remains of my home and my personal belongings after the flood of 1997. Books, journals, pictures, electrical equipment, dishes, you name it. Everything is caked with mud and toxic water. Inside, it doesn't get any better. About a foot of water swished around for about 12 to 14 hours. Items saved rest high. Who knows where they'll go now? The carpet is a mess littering the once landscaped yard. It all sounds quite depressing but there are many residents in Hidden Valley worse off than myself. Floodwaters crested inside numerous homes, spilling over beds, soaking up drywall, and destroying many valuables. Surprisingly, many residents are keeping positive. The guys are working on the outside, the girls are working on the inside, and I mean, it, it really did save all of our stuff because we did come together. The Captivilles are trying to make the best of the situation. They have set up beds in their living room, but not everyone is so lucky. Many homes are unlivable. The amount of cleanup after the flood of 1997 is frankly overwhelming. It's hard to know where to start, but I figured that packing away some items that I had saved was a move in the right direction. Some old friends, all Bishop Minogue High School graduates, stopped by to lend me a hand. There's Jennifer and Michelle Cobb. Their brother Ryan was here Wednesday, plus Carissa Meyer, a UNR women's basketball starter. The extra hands make a huge difference. In the middle of all that, a FEMA inspector showed up to evaluate the damages. I thought we'd be at it for hours. I couldn't believe that he was in and out in less than half an hour. There were so many things I thought he'd want to see, things he could write in his report. He did make some notes on his computer keypad, but that was it. A FEMA spokesperson says that's typical. Well, the inspectors are familiar with the area. They, many of them are, are seasoned uh, disaster specialists. They usually can make a rough, quick, and accurate determination of damages based on formulas for repair work in the area. Fortunately, I have some great friends who are allowing me to live at their home. It could be one to two months before I can move back into my home. FEMA says that they are here to help, providing temporary housing assistance, but nobody can give me any of the hard answers I desperately need. There's no e easy answer here. We. I uh, realize that people have, you know, have experienced disaster, they're under enormous stress and strain. Uh, we're doing all that we can uh, do to help people uh, get started in rebuilding their lives. Uh, they're going to need a lot of patience and fortitude to uh, pull themselves through. In the meantime, it's back to work and back to trying to deal with this muddy mess. I just pretend like I'm a light switch. I have to turn the light switch on to go to work, so I have to work, and I want to work, and it's what I love to do. And then at the same time, I have to go home and turn off the switch and cry, and get emotional and be upset. And I've learned through other past experiences that I've gone through that have been very hard, how to deal, how to cope, and how to take a break real quick and go into the bathroom and cry and then come back out and work. And sometimes I can do it and sometimes I can't, but I try. Church services weren't going to be washed away the first Sunday of the new year in Reno. Worshippers, big and small, no matter their outcome from the once risen waters, were going to make this Sunday a very good one. I think it's a good Sunday. I, I got choked up a couple of times in the service, and uh, I think people did some shedding of tears along the way, especially when our sandbagging efforts, uh, you know, were lost. Uh, but it's been an up Sunday. The Christian Science Church of Reno had to move their service and Sunday school to Huffaker Elementary School. The same faces, just a different setting. Well, the people that showed up today have a wonderful spirit for going on with their lives and not allowing the uh, flood to keep them from going to a place to worship. 
The folks at Trinity Church could have used Noah's Ark a few days ago. Father Jeffrey alluded to that fact earlier today. As we were engaged literally when we began the sandbagging incident and then realizing that it wasn't going to stave off, the image of the ark just kept coming back to me and I thought, we're going to talk about that on Sunday because I knew there was going to be a Sunday. For Reno, days of promise lay ahead. But while most of the flood area recovered quickly, most hotel rooms remained empty. Tourists who came to the Truckee Meadows saw this. Back home, wherever home was, they remembered this. It's hard to get that kind of image out of your mind, but it's played again and again nationwide. Now there's no denying the severity of the New Year's flood. We also know the damage could have been much worse. Ultimately though, what helped out most was good old-fashioned people power. Hundreds of volunteers doing anything they could with a sandbag or a shovel to keep the raging waters at bay. And as the waters receded, the city of Reno gave thanks. Oh, everybody was just moving as fast as you could. There are plenty of stories to hear, stories about ordinary people who suddenly became heroes fighting the New Year's flood. Some soldiers uh, helped with uh, sandbagging, transporting uh, sandbags. Uh, we did almost anything and everything. And every little bit of help was needed. The New Year's flood devastated the Truckee Meadows, but residents refused to give in. Thousands of people pitched in, and their hard work has not been forgotten. This party is for the volunteers. The city of Reno wanted to say thanks for all of the hard work and long hours. Uh, we're very appreciative of the, uh, the party, and whenever there's uh, plenty of food, we're always there, man. We're the first in line. Members of the Nevada Army National Guard came to celebrate, and while they can laugh about it now, they say trying to stop the rising floodwaters was no picnic. It wasn't uh, pleasant for them. Uh, freezing temperatures, uh, wet socks, wet soldiers, but they still uh, continued, some of them working up to 20 hours a day. I hope this is it for a while. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the Truckee River was barely a creek. Years of drought made us all wonder if this river would ever be healthy again. Well, it's healthy now. Maybe too healthy, considering what Mother Nature just tossed at us. But you know, living in northern Nevada means that at some point in time, another natural disaster will hit, whether it be an earthquake, a fire, or a flood. And when it does, heroes will emerge. Neighbor will help neighbor, and those in need will find that help. How do we know? Simply by looking back at the New Year's flood. For Channel 2 News, I'm Mike Alger.
The beauty of our northern Nevada skies is captured by Channel 2's Cloud Cam. Available soon on videotape for your enjoyment. Set to soothing music, Channel 2's Cloud Cam offers a unique perspective and highlights the powerful forces of nature. Cloud Cam. Keep watching Channel 2 KTVN for more information on how you can purchase this video.